I have a confession to make. Not only do I love fighting games, but I absolutely love crossover fighting games. Most times when there's a crossover in a fighting game, it usually just means that there is a guest from a completely different series. Such notable examples include the guest characters in the Soul Calibur series, like Link from The Legend of Zelda and the GameCube version of Soul Calibur 2, to insane ones like the Star Wars characters Yoda, Darth Vader, and the apprentice from The Force Unleashed in Soul Calibur 4. I shall release your power now. <laughs> Other examples include Negan from The Freakin' Walking Dead in Tekken 7, or Akuma from Street Fighter, who is also in the same game. And since we've mentioned Akuma, that leads us to a company that is considered the king of fighting games, Capcom. While they've had some blunders in recent years, it's hard to not think of the impact that Capcom had on fighting games. I mean, we wouldn't have this, or this, or even this, if it were not for this. Classic. But it was around this time during the fighting game boom that Capcom was able to acquire the rights to characters from Marvel Comics. This was a time when Marvel wasn't the big juggernaut that it was today. And in fact, they at one point were near the point of bankruptcy before the success of the X-Men and Spider-Man cartoons in the 90s. I'll chase you to the ends of the earth! Marvel themselves had been wanting to break into the Japanese market. And while Japanese companies like Konami and Data East released the arcade games X-Men and Captain America and the Avengers respectively, reception in Japan was mixed at best, with many critics and gamers loving the Data East game, but Konami's X-Men sold poorly in Japan and was considered unfair. Capcom had already released the Punisher in arcades and were soon to release X-Men Mutant Apocalypse. But the chance to create a licensed fighting game set for release in late 1994 ended up becoming one of the biggest crossover series in existence. Marvel vs. Capcom! This series has become synonymous with Capcom, along with their Street Fighter series, and has continued to have a dedicated following to this very day. In this series, we're going to be taking a look at every game in the series, from its early origins with X-Men Children of the Atom, all the way to... Nice weapon, Lance a little. Compensating for something? Aw, oh, that joke sucks! To start, we're gonna take a look at the two games that started it all, X-Men Children of the Atom and Marvel Super Heroes. In North America, the arcade games came out in January 1995 and October 1995 respectively, only about 10 months apart. And in Japan, it was about 11 months apart. The games themselves saw a release on the then new Sega Saturn. Now, one may be asking, well, why do you have the Japanese copies of the games when they've gotten international releases? And you know what? That's a good question. Let's take a look to see how much the American versions cost. Yeah, I think it's better to just stick to the Japanese copies. But seriously, because the Saturn and the Dreamcast, Sega's final console, did miserably here in the West, copies of a lot of the MVC games from this era are incredibly expensive. The Japanese versions are way easier to get a hold of. So the majority of the captured footage you'll be seeing here are from the Japanese versions of these games. But it won't affect things too much, as you'll see. And just to think that nearly 15 years ago, my brother got a copy of Sonic Jam on the Saturn for $30, when now it's... So let's put in Children of the Atom, and the game starts up and... X-Men. Now that's what I call a flashy intro. The characters show up ready to fight, even showing quick but useful hints, all culminating in X-Men. So here we have all our characters. We have our heroes and villains that are all synonymous with X-Men. So let's pick Wolverine. How can you have a Marvel fighting game and not have Wolverine? Round one. Fight! Tornado Claw. All right, so first things first. This game controls quite well. Unlike games at a time like Capcom's own Street Fighter, the game feels a lot more open and free. Rather than jumping in an arc, you end up jumping all over the place when fighting making some frenetic battles as you play. But it also allows more accessibility for gamers who may not be hugely into fighting games thanks to the Marvel license. This was something that set other fighting games apart at the time that were more cut and paste from the same gameplay as Street Fighter. 
Despite the Sega Saturn's problems, I feel that this console was more at home with fighting games than the PlayStation or the Nintendo 64. The controller itself has six buttons, which was common for arcade fighters to have at the time. Light, medium, and heavy punches are the X, Y, and Z buttons, and light, medium, and heavy kicks were the A, B, and C buttons. It just feels a lot better than, say, a PlayStation controller. And I just noticed, too, but the voices in this game are the same voice actors from the X-Men cartoon at the time. Real Off the glass. Hey, Ten Woodsman! I'm sending you back to Oz! I think it's pretty sweet that they were able to do that. Though the Silver Samurai was voiced by a Japanese actor. The story goes that Marvel rejected all the original voices for the game, except for the Silver Samurai. However, Capcom was able to get in touch with the Canadian studio that recorded for the X-Men cartoon, and they were able to get a majority of the actors to reprise and record lines from the game. Notably, Cathal Dodd, who voices Wolverine, also voices Iceman in this game. Honestly, this game is pretty solid. You have all your super combos, the music is fantastic, the art style is amazing, but there's one glaring flaw I should mention. This game is way too hard. I can't tell you how hard this game was. I kept dying and dying and dying. I can't tell you how many times I've seen this continue screen, and even when I have the automatic setting which is supposed to make it much easier to guard and do super moves as well as having the game on one star difficulty, I was still getting my ass kicked hard. This difficulty spike is all over the place, and nothing was more frustrating than fighting Goofy. Don't you know who I am? I'm the Juggernaut, bitch! The Juggernaut. Oh my god. No matter how many times I try to hit him, he does that stupid earthquake move that nearly takes out half of your life bar. I can't tell you how many times I've tried to beat him, but I kept getting beat over and over and over and... Yeah, this game is not great to go back to. It is way too tough as nails for me, and it was so hard that I just had to look up the different endings for the arcade mode on YouTube. And what was Wolverine's ending anyway? Well, after beating X-Men boss and boss of this game, Magneto, Wolverine offers him the chance of leaving with them, but Magneto declines and chooses to stay as the place around them crumbles. The X-Men get back, Wolverine gets cucked by Cyclops, and Wolverine decides to take a trip to Japan and beat Silver Samurai's ass. So yeah, this game may not have aged very well, and I don't really prefer to go back to it, but Marvel Super Heroes, on the other hand, I'll go back to it anytime. Released in late 1995, Marvel Super Heroes is loosely based off of the well-loved Infinity Gauntlet storyline, in which Thanos erases all life on Earth and it's up to the Marvel heroes to defeat Thanos and undo the wrongs. While COTA and MSH share similarities, they also have a lot of differences between the two. For starters, MSH is easier. Yes, while the game itself is still challenging, I was able to actually beat arcade mode with different characters. Speaking of certain characters, another difference is the new cast of characters. While we still have X-Men characters, we also have newcomers like Captain America, Iron Man, Shuma Gorath, and Blackheart? Okay, obscure characters aside, let's get into a match. I pick Spider-Man, he jumps off the screen, and after a 15 second loading screen, Showtime. Round two, fight! Oh boy, so little It may be my capture card or the game itself, but this is the only stage where the slowdown is this bad. Now, if you notice these gems down in the corner, these are what you can use to gain an advantage in the match. Some gems heal you, while others give you more attack power, but I could never figure out how to properly use them. I could look at the manual, but I'm still confused. Different characters will have different gems for you to get, and even if the character is defeated while they still have their gem, he'll still get the gem. You're not penalized in any way for not getting the gem during the match. I like that. 
Dr. Doom in this game is the mid-boss, while the real boss is Josh Brolin himself. He's actually a pretty good boss, and just loves to gloat about himself. Pray! Thanos reigns! After beating Thanos, Spider-Man uses the Infinity Stones to resurrect all of his friends in the background. Looks like they were eating McDonald's or something before they returned to stone. And hey, Cathaldot is Captain America. When you need someone to play a real American hero, go to Canada. This would be a game I'd recommend for those who want to get into fighting games. It's really easy to get into a match, and the Marvel license makes it easier for people to get into this game. MSH especially had more planned, with Thanos and Doctor Doom being playable characters, and even having Anita, from Capcom's own Darkstalker series, be a planned, playable, albeit secret character. Judging by how she plays, though, it seems she was cut early into development. But at the same time, it would be weird for Thanos to be attacking a little child. But he did help one become a major assassin. As these two games became wildly successful in the arcades and on the Saturn, Capcom and Marvel saw to it that they would make another licensed game based on the Marvel superheroes. And it would help define what makes the series as it is today. And it would involve Capcom's biggest fighting game series up to that point.